This video has been funded in part by the Guild via Patreon. Check out the links in the description or at the end of this video for more details. My name is Chris Gildart, and welcome back to another Pros vs. Cons review, the show where I present my complete list of pros and cons. I've been sitting on Ken's Rage for quite some time now, and I think it's the perfect moment to jump right in. Back in the day, I did get 100% of the achievements on 360, and I recently got all of the trophies on PS3. The Fist of the North Star series started as a manga with its first volume releasing September 13th, 1983, before getting an anime the following year on October 11th, 1984. But we're not talking about the original manga or anime, we're talking about the Musou spin-off Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage, which released on PS3 and 360 on March 25th, 2010 in Japan, November 2nd in North America, and November 5th in Europe. Now, Ken's Rage isn't the first Fist of the North Star video game, not by a long shot. The very first game was Hokuto no Ken, Violence Gekiga Adventure, which released exclusively in Japan on the NEC PC 8801 in May of 1980. 86. The first English release we would see would be Fist of the North Star on the NES in April of 1989. Like I said, I bought Ken's Rage for 360 back when it first came out and powered through this game to get all of the achievements. I've never watched the anime, I've never read the manga, even though I own the first volume. I've also only watched maybe the first five to ten minutes of the live-action movie. Since playing both Ken's Rage and its sequel, I've also played a bit of the Yakuza-style Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise and downloaded the demo for Fitness Boxing Fist of the North Star. Yeah, for some reason we can't get a third Ken's Rage, but we can get a Fitness Boxing spin-off. But all that is to say that I have no knowledge about the original manga or anime, but I do know what Fist of the North Star is in general. I also have a bit of knowledge about what I'm getting into, even though it's been well over a decade since I last played this game. But maybe I'm getting a little too far ahead of myself. Don't forget to give this video a like, comment with your thoughts below, and of course subscribe if you haven't already. Alright, let's jump into Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage with the first pro. This game looks so good for its time. I'm surprised how well it holds up given it's a 7th gen game. The PS3 and 360 were notorious for dropping frames having ugly textures, and being kind of on the brown side for a while there. Though Ken's Rage does have the brown thing going on, it is a post-apocalyptic setting, so it can be a little difficult to avoid that whole brown thing. The overall visuals on display are pretty impressive. Dynasty Warriors 7 wouldn't come out for another year at this point, so this is the best looking Warriors game we had seen. On top of that, all the character outfits have been redesigned for this game. I love Kenshiro's black leather jacket with the flames coming up the side. It really shouts wandering warrior of the wasteland. Ray's blue outfit is very suiting, especially with the white pants. Rao's armor is so freaking cool. Honestly, leagues better than his manga counterpart. Like, his pants in the original are beige. What is he wearing, khakis? Was Rao a salaryman before the apocalypse? Mamiya's outfit looks good both as the new Muso variation as well as the manga. Toki's outfit looks very similar, but it's the little details of Ken's Rage's outfit that brings it a couple steps above the manga. Same story goes for Shin. It's very close, but Koei's usual attention to detail really brings out his Musou outfit. Jaggy's outfit is another one that is a definite upgrade. I love the new spikes and holsters they gave him. It looks way more like someone who carries around five too many weapons. Finally, we have Souser, who probably had the best outfit change of anyone. Switching him from blues and whites to be more a dark purple and gold really gives him that vibe of a holy emperor. I honestly don't think there's a character design here that I dislike over the original. The closest would probably be Mamiya, but everyone else had a decent enough of a glow up that I would rather use these default costumes than the manga ones if they were in the game. 
Stages are also designed to extreme perfection. Yes, most of the stages are just sandy post-apocalyptic wastelands, but they somehow made them all feel unique and gave us something we can dive headfirst into and get lost in. These stages are massive in comparison to the other spin-offs we've seen in the past. I always praise Dynasty Warrior 6 for having large and well-designed stages. Ken's Rage takes that design philosophy and mixes it with what we would later see in Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3, which came out later in the year for Japan. We do have long corridors that lead to more open areas and bases where the majority of combat occurs, but there's more movement between bases, similar to Empire's titles. There's not as many pre-rendered cutscenes in this game either. The flow between cutscene and gameplay is pretty smooth, and though it doesn't flow as freely between each other like Dynasty Warrior 7, it can still be appreciated for what it is. That being said, Con! not everything about the graphics is all that great. I don't know if it's because my 360 copy is about as scratched as a DJ's turntable, but it runs like garbage. I ended up buying a PS3 copy to help fill out the collection, but to also show how it runs there, and it runs so much better. The cutscenes are rendered in 60 frames on PS3, while they are 30 on 360. Everything looks so much more crisp, and there's not as many frame drops than on Xbox. This is surprising because at the time, the 360 was still a powerhouse in the industry. The PS3 was only just starting to regain momentum in the market. I've always found that games ran a little more reliably on 360 as opposed to PS3 around this time, but Ken's Rage joins the ranks of Dynasty Warriors 8 and Final Fantasy 13 in being preferable on PS3 as opposed to 360, though the latter is backwards compatible on Xbox One and series, and now that is the preferred way of playing it. As well, I know I defended this game for its brown color palette because it's post-apocalyptic, but that's not really much of an excuse, especially when we have games like Borderlands and Horizon Zero Dawn. There is no reason you can't have a beautiful barren wasteland. Most other colors are dull or washed out, so if you're a fan of the color brown, dude, we are set! It's not just the colors that rub me the wrong way. The fact that this series is stuck on the 7th generation of consoles means we have to play at 720p, which means we get jaggies all over the place. I mean, look, there's a big one in the middle of my screen right now. Performance is still not perfect on PS3. The game just chugs super hard when the camera pans behind some of the environment. I also noticed overall performance and texture quality took a hit during Dream Mode when compared to Legend Mode. I would love to see Koei give this game another opportunity on Steam and or modern consoles. Overall, you may be impressed by the way that the game looks in still frames, but in action it can leave a little bit to be desired. Pro. The combat of this game is honestly one of the best in the Warriors franchise hands down. The game is a lot slower than your usual Warriors affair, but we're dealing with some extremely thought out martial arts here. We're not wiping out waves of enemies with an ancient Chinese Gatling gun. Gameplay, especially in Legend Mode, which is the game's main story, feels like the natural evolution of old school beat-em-up games like Streets of Rage or Final Fight. The great stage design plays extremely well here with many twists and turns. I would say that this is very similar to that of the first One Piece Pirate Warrior story, where there's lots of stage exploration and handfuls of paths for you to take. But where Pirate Warriors came out in 2012 and Ken's Rage in 2010, it's surprising to see Ken's Rage provide a much deeper, more action-oriented story experience. This doesn't quite feel like a Musou game, but the combat itself still retains that signature Musou feel. Square is your normal attack, triangle is your charge attack, circle is your Musou or special attack. X is jump, L1 is guard, R1 is a special move, but what makes things interesting is that every character has a grapple move set to R2. You can also turn off the map just like in Samurai Warriors 1 and the first three Pirate Warriors games, which is a nice little challenge you can give yourself to navigate through these large stages without a map, or as I like to call it, a Zoro run. You would also think that a game with only hand-to-hand -hand gameplay would make a lot of characters feel the same, and that it would make dealing with larger groups of enemies a little tough. When Heihachi was a guest character in Soul Calibur 2 on PS2, he definitely felt like he was working with a handicap due to his lack of range. The developers decided to make up for it with sheer power. Well, in Ken's Rage, even though some enemies have axes and swords, and even though characters like Jaggy and Mamiya are playable characters with ranged weapons, characters like Kenshiro, Rei, Toki, etc. have quite the range on them using things like Aura and Ki to extend their reach. 
Many moves have a slashing action along with a wave of energy that extends their range by quite a bit. Characters like Rao even having key blasts reminiscent of Dragon Ball Z. Musos are closer to what we see in Dynasty Warriors 7 and 8, but instead of having one or two Musos, we're given a list of up to 8 different Musos where you can equip 4 to the D-pad and swap between them. Some Musos use more than one bar and have different ranges and effects, making it really useful to give yourself a varied loadout to take on both groups of enemies and single powerful enemy officers. Like I said earlier, Legend Mode is the main story mode and covers the manga pretty well. Similar to classic Warriors games, we get character-specific stories for Kenshiro, Rei, Toki, Mamiya, and Rao. Kenshiro's story being the longest at around 13 chapters, Rei, Toki, Mamiya, and Rao all have stages similar to Kenshiro's but play out slightly different. Sometimes it's something like Toki and Rao cleaning up the path to Souser before Ken shows up. I know I mentioned that each character has their own special skill, but they all also have different exploration mechanics in Legend Mode. Kenshiro has the most basic of exploration abilities. He gets a Muso attack that can break walls with the seven stars of Hokuto on them, and that's about it. Rei gets the ability to jump over walls that have the ninja jump look from Ninja Gaiden. Mamiya can crawl under small areas for a bit of fan service. Toki can use areas flowing with energy to get over large gaps, and Rao has the ability to make himself invulnerable to poison water, fire, and other environmental hazards. This helps to make exploration so much fun. Oh great, am I lost again? If you're not looking for an action-adventure beat-em-up style story, you can always lean on Dream Mode, which gives every playable character a completely original story. Here is where you'll play as any of the Legend Mode characters, as well as Jaggy, Shin, and Souser in a more traditional Musou experience. In Dream Mode, you have a variety of bases to take over. Morale is tied to how many bases you have captured. At the top of the map, it will show you how many bases each army has. As you take out certain officers and bases, you'll progress the story of that specific Dream Mode stage. Similar to Legend Mode, there are a few hidden secrets in Dream Mode, these mostly being containers with extra skill points in them. Skill points can be used to fill out each character's unique skill trees. This is where you'll buy stat increases, passive skills, and Muso attacks. Passive skills can be something as simple as increasing the damage your Musos do, to something a little bit more complex, like giving every single one of your attacks attacks one of the three martial arts styles, which can be very useful if you're going for that platinum trophy. Every character has every passive skill in their tree, but they are placed in different areas, so it leads to a slightly different progression for each character, making it really fun to go for 100% on each character. Honestly, if you're a Musou fan and you haven't experienced Ken's Rage, you're missing out big time. Con! One thing I know many of you have already noted as your own con, whether you've played this game or not, is the character roster. We only get eight total characters, with Kenshiro, Rei, Toki, Mamiya, Rao, Jagi, Shin, and Souser. There are two DLC characters in Heart and Outlaw, but that brings up a big con that I've mentioned for other games in the past, like Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3. The DLC has been delisted, and you can no longer get the characters on any platform unless you've already bought that DLC. I never got the opportunity to buy any of the DLC for PS3, meaning I can only play these DLC characters on my broken 360 copy. Luckily, these characters were included in the sequel as non-DLC characters, so if you really want to play as them, you do still have a way just not in this game. That being said, I feel like there are a ton of other characters that should have been playable in this game to begin with. Yuda, Zed, Boss Fang, Amiba, Uyghur, Shu, Ryuga, Fudo, and Juza are some that stand out. Like, at this point, I don't care if characters like Amiba and Toki are clones of each other, or characters like Boss Fang and Uyghur. Hell, you could have made Zed and Outlaw have similar movesets, but no, we're stuck with one of the lowest character counts in Muso history. Even the first Dynasty Warriors, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, had a larger 
character count before you even started unlocking anyone. Like, I can understand Koei and Omega Force wanting to focus on the main characters of the story, with a main focus being on the protagonists. But if you're gonna go that far, Fudo, Juza, Shu, and Ryuga would have been good playable character material. With how much of a villain Yuda is today and Mamiya, he would have made another great addition. But no, we're stuck with eight total playable characters, meaning your replay value is stuck to trying to max out every character, which I'll get to replayability later. For the moment, this roster is about as full as I am after a fancy meal. Pro. One thing that slapped me directly in my face as I started playing Ken's Rage was the soundtrack. I grew up listening to new metal and grunge, so hearing this soundtrack lean into the dropped tunings, a heavy riff focus, along with the chug of the palm muted rhythm section, it's no wonder this is near the top of my list for favorite Musou soundtracks. There's even a Musou rendition of the main theme of Fist of the North Star, Aiwo Tori Domase. This song plays during a lot of the more important one-on-one -on -one fights you might experience, and it fucking rocks. I remember downloading this soundtrack off of a sketchy site back in the day, and it was one of the soundtracks I listened to the most while working on things where I didn't want lyrics to mess with what I was thinking. Remember kids, don't listen to the voice inside your head. You don't want to know what they've got planned. On top of the absolute based soundtrack, we have another thing to help give those ears something to be happy about. We have a full English cast of characters, with many voices coming from other Warriors games. You've got Kaiji Tang voicing Kenshiro, who you might recognize as Sima Zhao in Dynasty Warriors. Douglas Rai as the narrator of Legend Mode, who also lent his voice as Cao Cao in Dynasty Warriors 5 through 8, and Nobunaga in the first Samurai Warriors. And and of course, you gotta have Dave B. Mitchell as Rao, who you can recognize as Guan Yu from Dynasty Warriors 6 through 8. I'm so happy to have an English dub for a game like this. I now have some voices I can assign to these characters when I finally get around to reading the manga. I also noticed a lot of small details that might generally be taken for granted normally. Not only do we have victory animations, but we also get intro animations for every character. These intro animations animations are also used when you run into the characters as enemies. They just may have a different line of dialogue when they appear. Even NPC characters like the ones I mentioned should have been playable have their own intro and defeat animations. I really think with these and the combat mechanics, it gives a nice blended experience between the classic and modern Warriors games. There are other things I noticed like the fact that the ground shakes when Rao jumps. He's the only character that does this, and it's a nice little add a detail when you finally unlock him and get to play as him. Then you have the motorcycles which appear in some stages. They function almost exactly like a horse does. Which is cool because a horse does make an appearance with Rao's trusty Kokuogo. Finally you all know me for loving cosmetic extras, costumes, weapons, etc. It all goes a long way for replayability and grinding. Well, we may be missing out on the manga-specific costume DLC that was delisted, but we do get a couple of unlockable costumes for Kenshiro, Rei, Toki, and Rao. When you complete Rei's Legend Mode story, you get his white hair costume, while finishing Kenshiro's and Rao's Dream Mode story unlocks their shirtless costumes, and finally completing Toki's Dream Mode story unlocks his healthy costume, where his hair is dark and he's clean shaved. This costume for Toki is more than cosmetic though, because normally at at the end of some of Toki's combos, you will randomly drop to one knee and cough. You can get around this by never going the full combo, but with Toki's healthy costume, you never have to deal with that, giving this another minor detail that can go unnoticed, but I definitely appreciate it. Con! Though I had a handful of nice minor details to praise, I have even more to complain about. During Legend and Dream Mode, you may have various missions appear, similar to how Samurai Warriors handles its missions. However, with Ken's Rage, a message will pop up and pause gameplay in order to tell you what the mission is. This can bring a halt to gameplay and pull you out of the experience. I really wish there was an option, similar to modern Samurai Warriors games, to either have the pop-up or have it appear along the side and not stop gameplay. As well, Ken's Rage feels like it is designed very heavily around dodging attacks. From time to time, you may see an enemy charging up an attack, 
unless you use a charge or muso attack on them, they won't flinch. These attacks can have a decent range and knock you back, making them very annoying. However, you may have noticed that I never mentioned a dodge button when talking about the controls, and that's because dodge is considered a special ability, which would be mapped to R1. Not every character has this as their ability. In fact, only two characters do, Kenshiro and Rei. Rao isn't as bad as his special ability is to make him invulnerable, meaning he can tank most attacks but every other character feels like they are incomplete in this game. Mamiya, one of the weakest characters in the game, really needs a dodge mechanic. I mean, how are you only going to give two characters a dodge? Does this mean the other six characters are just completely incapable of dodging? One thing I may not touch on with these reviews are the extra modes. Some extra modes don't really appeal to me. Back when I was younger, I played a lot of these challenge modes, trying to go for a higher score and such, but as I've gotten older, I appreciate the main gameplay way more. And it's no different with Ken's Rage's challenge mode. Here, you have to take on waves of enemies, sometimes times being more of a boss rush than anything. This is very challenging, and it feels like you need to take in a character who can dodge. On top of that, properly timed dodges are absolutely required in these challenges. Needless to say, I haven't completed any, which kind of feels like a cop-out. I think it would be good to have a handful of easier ones to get the player started, then slowly ramp up the difficulty as you go on. I complained about Samurai Warriors 5 Citadel mode when I did the mini-review of that, but at least it had an incremental difficulty to it. Lastly, I need to mention something that on the surface may seem like a pro to me, but the more I think about it, I am definitely leaning toward a con. The platinum trophy for this game is way too easy. Like, all you need to do is complete every Legend and Dream Mode story and get 5,000 kills with each of the three fighting styles. That's it. <laughs> Even I have more difficult completion requirements. This makes for one of the easiest Platinum Trophies or 100% of any Warriors game, but it can still be easy while providing the player with more replayability. First off, I think an achievement for completing one character's Meridian chart or their skill tree, and another for completing all characters. There are only 8 characters in this game, so completing everyone's shouldn't be that tough. As well, each stage has 8 bonuses that can be unlocked for full completion. This can range from finding a hidden chest with a skill point scroll, up to finishing off the final boss of the stage with a specific move. This is never utilized for achievements, and I think that's a complete missed opportunity. You could have one achievement for getting all of one stage's bonuses, and another for getting all stage bonuses. These bonuses can also help your rank at the end of the stage, with an A being the highest. This could have been another two achievements to get A rank on one stage and then on all. You could even throw some random ones in there, like taking Healthy Toki into a fight with Rao in his Legend Mode story. I don't know, I feel like there's way more the team could have done to give us more of a reason to come back to this game. In the end, I feel like Ken's Rage is one of those games that is both a fun game to play and a game that leaves a lot to be desired. I had a good time playing this game back in the day when I first picked it up, and even now, playing through it a second time, I had just as much fun. Would I recommend Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage? Absolutely. Thanks to how Legend Mode is structured, I feel this game would appeal to Musou fans, Fist of the North Star fans, and Beat 'em Up fans. I know many people have described Musou games as a natural progression to the 2D hack and slash and beat 'em ups of the SNES and Genesis era, but Ken's Rage really leans heavily into the evolution and provides one of the best 3D beat 'em up experiences I can find. The stage-by-stage -stage design of Musou games also provides a slightly arcadey feel to the game, which could appeal to classic beat-em-up fans as well. So with all that being said, I give Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage a 7 out of 10. I love how this game feels. The slower combat can be a little sluggish if you come from other Musou games, but after a few minutes of gameplay, it feels very natural. It is a bit of a disappointment that the DLC has been delisted, but what we get in the base game is still pretty decent. The usual strong Musou gameplay experience is here. If you feel like playing past the Platinum Trophy or 100% achievements, there's a lot to grind towards. That being said, these things that you can do after getting all of the achievements 
achievements should have been achievements to begin with. I also would have liked to see the roster filled out just a bit more. I feel like a dozen characters is a good number for the first entry of a Warriors game. You'd only need four more characters to fill it out enough. Heart and Outlaw being DLC characters could have been put into the base game. Then add Yuda and Fudo. And you're golden for the first run of an IP. Though I would keep Heart and Outlaw as DLC characters and replace them with Amiba and Ryuga. Maybe Shu as well. But even if I feel this game could use a bit more meat on its bones, I still enjoyed what I got. I mean, you can't have steak all the time. Sometimes you just gotta have a nice, greasy, disgusting burger. Not that Ken's Rage is disgusting or anything. Anyways, everyone, thank you so much for watching my review of Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and subscribe for more. How did you first get into Fist of the North Star? Let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to help support the channel and what I do here, you can join the guild just like these awesome people that you're seeing on screen right now. You can join their names at the end of every single video for just a dollar a month over on Patreon, or you can donate in a one-time fashion and join the volunteer unit over on Coffee. A special shout out to my guild general, Beggy Beg Beg, for supporting this channel at the top tier. There are other wards and other tiers as well, so check out the links that you see on screen, and I will see you all down in the comments.